a real pleasure to uh, invite Peter Simmons to come here to give a seminar. And Peter uh, got your bachelor's degree in zoology in Oxford University, and then he went to Australian National University and to, did a PhD with uh, Professor Adrian Horridge, who is the former director of the Gatti Marine Lab here. And then Peter went to Cambridge and he did two years postdoc with uh, Professor Malcolm Burroughs in the geology department there. And then he settled in Newcastle and stayed there for a long time. And kept recruiting or poking the locus uh, neurons. And working on these weird animals and sometimes uh, require uh, thinking outside the box. And one thing Peter and his wife did was to play Star Wars video to the locus <laughs> and record the, the neuron activity <laughs> in the locus brain. And uh, an ex unexpected uh, result from that experiment uh, was the, the award of uh, an Eagle Nobel Prize <laughs> uh, for peace. <laughs> 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 and uh, oh, okay, uh, let's see uh, what uh, what things in the nucleus brain has fascinated uh, Peter for so long? Uh, and uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> So thank you, Wen Chang, and thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk to you. So I'm going to actually talk about this pathway. This represents a pathway. And I put it up here because I know it's Friday afternoon and you might forget where we've got to. So at various points, I'll tell you where we've got to along this pathway. We're going to look um, at what happens between sense organs on the head of an animal, the locust here, right down to the neurons that control movements of the wings, the motor neurons. So here's a locust, and the locust head is well endowed with lots of sensory structures. They include these things, which are the compound eyes, and these are the ones that won us the Ig Nobel Prize for peace, for intergalactic harmony, because we were showing Star Wars to the locust. <laughs> and this, uh, the eyes, the compound eyes, are associated with a very large number of neurons that um, give the locust all kinds of information. They are really associated with seeing things, seeing different kinds of movements, maybe seeing shapes. What I'm going to talk about are another kind of eye that the locust has, and whether or not you call the function of these eyes vision or not, um, doesn't really matter. They are eyes and the locust quite clearly uses them for particular tasks. So there are three of these eyes, one on either side of the head and then one pointing forwards at the middle and these are called ocelli. They're also called simple eyes because unlike the compound eyes, they each have just one lens. And if we take the front off the locust, then we can see its brain behind it here the compound eyes are associated with large structures called the optic lobes there. Um, the optic lobes are almost as big as the rest of the brain put together. The ocelli are associated with much smaller parts of the brain, but they're associated with some particularly large nerve cells. And that's the reason why I've been looking at the ocelli for several years. Um, you can easily get sucked into looking at very peculiar things to do with the ocelli. And recently, I've started to wonder again exactly what the ocelli are for. So I'm going to head off towards thinking about what the function for another kind of eye, these eyes, could be in locus towards the end. So the ocelli associated with some of the largest neurons in a locust, that makes them very inviting targets for uh, someone to put electrodes in and find out how they work. So I'm going to talk partly about how neurons talk to each other and partly about what the signals that these neurons produce mean for the locus behavior. And there are two techniques that I've used that I'm going to talk about today. One is electrophysiology, and that means using intracellular electrodes to look at what happens as signals go from one neuron, these are stylized neurons, to another. In other words, how the neurons talk to each other across synapses. And some of the experiments I'm going to talk about, I used another electrode 
to inject signals into the presynaptic neuron so I can record what's happening in the postsynaptic neuron at the same time. More recently, some of the experiments we've done have simply been listening in, listening in to spikes, the signals that pass down long axons of neurons um, from the brain, in the case of these neurons, to uh, the motor control centres that control the wings. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the structure of the synaptic connections. So we're going to look, use electron microscope to look at um, what these structures, the synapses, look like. So the acella pathway contains some very large and maybe unusual synapses. I'd like to think they're not actually unusual synapses, it's just that uh, because of the experiments that the large size of these neurons has made it possible to do, they've revealed some rather unexpected things about the ways in which nervous, uh, nerve cells can talk to each other. I'm also hopefully going to convince you that the acelli are designed for timing. They give very precisely timed signals and it's those precisely timed signals that travel down to the motor control system that can influence the way that the locust moves its wings. So they give brief, well-timed excitation to flight motor neurons. They actually work as horizon monitors. They look out towards the horizon. So the acelli don't make focused images. Um, the image that a locust makes is focused slightly behind the uh, photoreceptors of the retina. So they are collecting light and they collect light over a very large area and individual neurons are extremely sensitive to changes in light. They're more sensitive than the equivalent neurons of the compound eyes. So they're not really designed for form vision at all, at least in locusts. They are designed instead to collect light over a very wide area and something that will stimulate them very well is movements of the visual horizon in front of a locust moving up and down or as the locust rolls from side to side that will also stimulate the laterally pointing acelli very well. These things are spikes and these are the things that most people think about when um, talking about or considering the way in which brain neurons work. Many neurons in the brain do use spikes and the person who first discovered um, the basic code that spikes use was E.D. Adrian a long time ago and he showed that the more excited, the more exciting a stimulus is, the higher the rate of spikes. So there's a kind of frequency coding that many neurons use in order to convey the strength of excitation or the urgency of a signal. The more urgent a signal is, the greater the frequency of spikes. But Adrian realised that this can't be the whole story. He wrote that the nerve fibre, an axon, is clearly a mechanism of limited scope because it can only transmit a succession of brief explosive waves. One of these spikes is an explosive wave. So the message can only be varied by changes in the frequency of these spikes. The briefer the discharge, then the less opportunity there will be for signalling uh, using this change in frequency of spikes. If you're an animal like an insect flying around making very rapid turns, then you really need to be able to react to things on a very uh, brief time base. And that means that you can only have time for counting a very few number of spikes. So maybe this mechanism of encoding information by spike rate is not all there is about spikes. So that's what I'm going to return to towards the end of the talk um, when I'm going to try and tell you about a celly generating a spike timing code rather than just a spike frequency code. So I'm always managing to jump ahead using these devices. For some time, people have realised that many insects have three acelli when they're adults, um, in addition to their compound eyes. And it tends to be insects that are very good at flying, that have well-developed acelli. Uh, 
The exception is beetles. Beetles hardly ever have a celly. There are some fossil beetles that do have a celly, but I don't think there are any uh, presently alive beetles that do have a celly. So people generally think there's something, some connection between the ability to fly and having good acelli. However, primitive insects, and this is uh, a bristle tail, which is um, a, a living relative of some of the uh, insects that are thought to be ancestral, this does have an acellus that is just below its compound eye. So possession of acelli, possession of three acelli, seems to be a very primitive insect trait. Exactly why they uh, developed, we really got no idea, but it's not something that followed the development of flying. Many modern insects have two or three well-developed acelli, and here are some good examples. Cockroaches, everyone's favourite insect, they have a single pair of acelli, uh, one on either side of the head, shown there. Dragonflies have very, very good acelli. There's a particularly large one, uh, a bit like a bay window on the front of its nose, sticking out at the front, and it has a pair of lateral acelli either side of that as well. Cicadas, one of my favourite insects, they have very colourful sometimes acelli, sometimes they're bright red in cicadas. Mayflies have bizarre looking acelli, they have bizarre looking eyes, and here's its acellus here, quite a bulbous structure. And evolution of acelli is even continuing to the present day. This is um, a report of a robot fly that appeared earlier this year, and this is endowed with acelli that help it to fly in a stable kind of way. The people that made this can't count properly, however, because rather than three acelli, the robofly has four <coughs> acelli. So one of the reasons for looking at acelli, besides the fact that they're simply there, is that they are connected with the largest neurons that carry information into an insect's brain. And that goes for many kinds of insects. Here's um, an acella neuron of a cockroach, this is a second order neuron that's shown here. It branches over the uh, surface of the retina of the acellus and it has a single process that we call the axon that travels into the brain. And in locusts, these neurons, second order neurons, have a similar structure to that. So here's one that I stained and that's photographed through the acella lens itself. So it's extending out to a very large part of the acella retina. Here are some dragonfly large second order neurons and they're associated with the lateral acellus and I want you to notice simply that there are lots of different kinds of them, different branching patterns of these neurons. And if we look at other insects such as a honeybee, there are even more branching patterns. If you look at one insect, one kind of insect's um, acella neurons, then they look rather different from another. So there's not any conformity in the way that these neurons are arranged from one kind of animal to another. Here's a blowfly's acella neurons, some of them branching to one side of the brain, some to the other, and some to both sides of the brain. Um, flies have a rather peculiar characteristic. In most insects, these acella neurons have their cell bodies and nuclei inside the brain itself, but in flies, the cell bodies are out towards the acellus itself. Here's one of them. Here's the acellus and the brain would be down there. So there's lots of diversity in the way that acelli and acella neurons are arranged in different insects. Dragonflies have a particularly interesting acelli because they actually do form a focused image of the visual horizon on part of the retina. The work I'm going to talk about, I've had two collaborators in particular. Um, one of these is Gerd Leitinger, who was a postdoc in my lab and then uh, went back to Graz in Austria, where he now has a position as an electron microscopist. And this guy is a physicist, Rob de Reuter van Stevenink. One of his, um, one of his ancestors was the last person to defeat the British Navy in a major engagement, but that was several years ago. But <laughs> he's a, a physicist, he's got a great interest in the way in which visual neurons work, 
Uh, so he's the person that's responsible for the sums, the results of which I'm going to tell you about, and the sums themselves I can't possibly explain to you. So one reason for looking at locusts is that we can now follow signals all the way from the level of the receptor cells that catch light right down to motor neurons that control the muscles. So we can follow the signals step by step through the whole of a pathway in an animal, and there aren't many examples where you can actually do that. In the acella, there are hundreds of individual photoreceptor cells, and those pass signals on to the next order neurons along, second order neurons, of which there are a handful. There are two kinds of these in locusts. There are some, some of them have quite wide axons, and we refer to the, those as L neurons, L standing for large, there are also some other axons that are much smaller that we know next to nothing about. The L neurons then pass their signals on to identifiable third order brain neurons, of which this is an example. Here's its cell body. It collects information up here from the L neurons. It transforms signals into trains of spikes, and those trains of spikes travel down the axon into the thorax of the locust, where one of their targets is particular motor neurons of some of the muscles with which the locust flies. Photoreceptors in the retina and the L neurons convey signals entirely by using small graded changes in membrane potential. They never produce all or none spikes. And that kind of processing is very similar to other eye neurons, including neurons in the compound eye of insects, but also in the vertebrate eye. In these neurons, the third order neurons, the graded potential signals are transformed into all or none spikes. So one of the things that I'm able to look at is the way in which one kind of signaling, graded potentials, is converted into another currency for signaling um, spikes or action potentials. So here's the pathway. Start off in the acellus. This is a drawing of an L neuron. I can never produce a very good photograph of a whole L neuron, so I've given you a drawing here. These really are very simple neurons. This is the branching of the neuron in the acellus, so it collects input signals from photoreceptors. Those signals travel along this long axon into the brain, so the brain would start more or less there. Here's the cell body of the L neuron and it has a very simple branching pattern inside the brain itself. The L neurons communicate onwards, and one of their targets is this neuron here that is called DNI, and the L neurons uh, connect with DNI in this region here, which is a reason, region we call the acella tract. There are maybe three pairs, maybe slightly more, of these large neurons that are associated with the acelli in the brain of a locust. These neurons have axons that travel into the thorax and contact flight motor neurons. So, sorry. Here are the kinds of signals that these different neurons produce. In response to a pulse of light, a photoreceptor cell in an insect depolarizes, so that's upside down to the way in which a photoreceptor of a vertebrate responds. The L neurons hyperpolarize, so that means the photoreceptors inhibit these L neurons. And in the third order neuron, DNI for example, changes in light are signaled as greater changes in potential but those control the production of these large spikes, and those large spikes are the signals that will travel down the axon to deliver excitation to motor neurons in the thorax. So we have a transformation between graded changes in potential earlier on into these all or none spikes, um, delivering commands to the motor system. Associated with each of the lateral acelli of a locus, there are seven individual L neurons, and there are three different morphological classes of those. Three of them look like this one, and it, this is the kind that 
I know most about. So these are simply called L1, L2 and L3. There are a couple of others associated with each of the lateral ocelli that are a little bit longer. These are called L4 and L5. And although I know that these neurons talk to these neurons, I've got no idea what L4 and L5 talk to. They must have some targets, so that's something that remains to be discovered. There are also a couple of other neurons that are slightly strange. They have arborizations, they collect information in both the lateral ocellus and the median ocellus. So they have long loop-like axons that loop from one ocellus to another. It's mainly these neurons that I'm going to be talking about. By making paired recordings and doing stains, and this is work that I did a long, long time ago, um, I can generate a kind of wiring diagram for the way in which these different neurons connect up. L1, L2 and L3 talk to each other and they actually inhibit each other. So these curved arrows indicate that these three neurons are inhibiting each other. But they pass signals onwards through excitatory connections. They pass them on to DNI and probably other similar neurons. And they also excite these longer L neurons called L4 and L5. So that's the basic wiring pattern of most of these L neurons. The synapse that L neurons make with DNI is really a very large structure. It's a major structure, so that indicates it's of some importance to the locust. Otherwise, presumably, the locust wouldn't go to the bother of making such a big structure. So here's uh, DNI injected in the brain, cell body there. We don't know what these branches do. Some of these branches collect information from wind hairs on the head. These branches all collect information from the axons of L neurons. So here's a uh, montage photograph of processes of uh, DNI stained. And all of these fine branches, they look a bit like a poplar tree. They're grabbing hold of individual axons of L neurons. If we cut a section through the tract here, here's a uh, light microscope section in which um, toluidine blue's been used to stain the, uh, the neurons. DNI is stained black because it's been stained with cobalt and then silver. And you can see some of the dendrites branching out here. And if we take a pile of these and then reconstruct them, you can see that the main branch of DNI sends out individual little branches and those go to make contact particularly with the axons of L1, L2 and L3, and also these other neurons, the ML neurons that connect um, the median ocellus to the lateral ocellus. They don't connect with L4 and L5. Using an electron microscope, we can look at the structure of individual synapses, and these are fairly typical locust synapses. So if you looked anywhere in the central nervous system of a locust, you'd find lots of synapses that look like this. Here's an L neuron. The L neuron axon has many synaptic vesicles in it and a DNI processes there uh, just below this darkly strain staining process that we call the presynaptic bar. L neurons always make synapses onto two adjacent postsynaptic profiles. That's a common feature in insects. We don't understand why it's there, but synapses are almost always a dyadic in structure. There are two postsynaptic processes in insects' central nervous systems. L neuron axons in the synaptic region are packed with vesicles. So I refer to these as clouds of vesicles. There are two L neuron axon profiles shown here, each of them full of lots of vesicles and making a number of synapses identified by these densely stained bars. If we take a little part of this axon and do a 3D reconstruction, which is what Gerd Leitinger did, can then trace onto it where these presynaptic bars are 
and these blue staining regions are the regions where there are these clouds of vesicles. So there are a few patches of bare membrane where there aren't synapses, but most of this region is covered with synaptic structures. And in the synaptic region, the vesicles occupy about 6% of the axon volume. The synapse itself is composed of 10,000 individual contacts, so 10,000 individual presynaptic bars that vary in length between about 0.1 to 1.5 microns long. If you added all these up together, you get a total length of the synapse for about one millimetre. So that's a big structure in terms of cell size. And altogether, there are maybe about a million vesicles ready for release. So it's a fairly big structure. So I'm now going to talk about how this structure actually transmits information onwards. So here's an L neuron. Although the L neuron has a long axon, it has a very long space constant. That is very useful because it means that it doesn't really matter where you put an electrode to record signals. If you record a signal from here, then it's very similar to the signal that's recorded at the base of the acellus or further down. So that's very useful in terms of electrophysiology because we can really forget about complicated electrical uh, properties of this long axon. The way that an L neuron responds to light is by making these graded changes in potential. So this is a very unnatural stimulus, but one that physiologists often use. It's simply a light stimulus going on in the dark. And the stronger the light stimulus is, then the larger this graded change in potential. When the light goes off, there's also a graded change in potential. And again, the size of that depends on how big the stimulus is, how big the change from light to dark is at the end of this stimulus. So, can I have a new finger, please? <laughs> how is it that these synapses from the L neurons to neurons like DNI, how do these carry this kind of signal? Is it transformed in any kind of way? And the answer is that it is because the signals in the postsynaptic neurons are not exactly the same as the signals in the L neuron. So to study synaptic transfer, what I did was to make changes in presynaptic uh, membrane potential. So I injected current into the presynaptic neuron. Here's the voltage change in the presynaptic neuron. And in this, in this experiment, what I did was use slowly changing ramps of current. And I used a voltage clamp to do that, not so that I can measure current changes, which is what you usually use voltage clamps for. But in this case, it was to have a very precise control over what was happening to the presynaptic neuron, to very precisely control this voltage signal in the presynaptic neuron. The postsynaptic neuron follows this change in the presynaptic potential. First of all, there's a threshold value. You need to exceed a certain threshold before there's any transmission. But after that, there's a fairly good graded relationship between small changes in presynaptic potential and small changes in postsynaptic potential. I delivered several different changes, uh, several different repetitions of this ramp to the presynaptic neuron, and that was to look at how variable the postsynaptic response is. So you can see from one to another, there is some wobble in the postsynaptic response. And that wobble is important because it contaminates the signal as it's uh, transferred from one neuron to another, and it sets a limit as to how well the synapse conveys signals. So this is a synaptic transfer curve that shows presynaptic potential against postsynaptic potential and it has this kind of S shape which is typical of uh, all chemical synapses but what I've added here is an indication of the variability in the postsynaptic response in the reliability of synaptic transfer. And if we look at the width of this variability, 
one of the things we can do is estimate how many discrete levels of signal the synapse can transfer. And it turns out to be about 20 different signal levels. So there is a limit to how fine the gradations in signals can be as they're transferred from one neuron to another across the synapse. So if we take an 8 millivolt postsynaptic range of signals and look at the size of the variability either side of the mean, um, we end up with this estimate of about 20 discrete signal levels. There's another thing about this curve that is rather puzzling, and I don't know the answer to this puzzle yet. That is that the variability in, trans in the signal, in the postsynaptic signal, doesn't change with the size of the postsynaptic signal. So below the threshold for transmission, there's a fairly small variability. It gets a little bit bigger as the synapse switches on, but after that, it bounces around a bit, but it doesn't get larger. And that's rather strange, because if you think of a simple model of synaptic transmission, you can model that as a kind of jar that's full of peas, and the jar has um, holes in it. As you shake that, that jar around, some of the peas will pop out of the, uh, pop out of the holes. The harder you shake it, the more peas will, shake, will drop out, but also the greater the variability in the number of peas that drop out. This synapse isn't working like that. It's a bit more bright, if you, uh, if you like. So there is something that makes this synapse equally reliable at all of its signal levels. And exactly how changes in presynaptic voltage regulate the release of transmitter is a little bit of a puzzle. We can do some sums with this, or at least Rob could do some sums with this and show me how to do them. So um, instead of uh, simply giving lights on and lights off as simple stimuli, what we did was to deliver varying presynaptic potentials using a voltage clamp to deliver this kind of white noise waveform and repeat that over and over again and record the postsynaptic potential then we could use that kind of uh, experiment to estimate how good the synapse is at conveying information. So to do that, what you need to do is to work out the signal-to-noise ratio in the postsynaptic response. And these graphs show um, the presynaptic signals, the spectral density, the postsynaptic signals, uh, spectral density and the presynaptic signals spectral density. Now if we look at this one, we can work out the signal to noise ratio for each particular frequency. If we add all those up together, we can get an estimate of the information carrying capacity of the synapse, which is about 415 bits per second, which to most people doesn't mean anything at all. But it does mean that this synapse is pretty good. There aren't many synapses that have been measured um, another synapse that Rob and Simon Laughlin worked on in the fly compound eye is a little bit better than that, um, but it does give some kind of uh, gauge that we can compare this synapse with others. So here's our artificial stimulus, a flash of light. There are slow, sustained signals in the O-neuron response, but there are also these very fast signals when light switches off. And these signals are rebound spikes. Uh, they're spikes simply from their shape. Um, they're much smaller than classical axonal action potentials, so they're fairly small, but the important thing about them is they provide very fast depolarizing signals. If we look from one side of a synapse to another, and in this case it's the synapse that the neuron L1 makes with one of the other L neurons, L4, but this could equally well be one of the DN neurons, then these spikes, these rebound spikes, become enhanced as they cross it. So this spike is smaller than the postsynaptic spike, and the postsynaptic spike also rises a bit more sharply than the presynaptic spike. 
Small respon uh, responses in uh, the presynaptic neuron tend to make uh, small spikes in the postsynaptic neuron. So this synapse does enhance these spikes. So there's something important about those spikes. Another thing about this synapse is that it clips the hyperpolarizing responses to light. These big responses take the synapse well below the threshold for transmission. So any slow change in uh, presynaptic potential here won't be transmitted onwards across the synapse. So is all this signal redundant? This signal, for example, looks like it won't be transmitted onwards across the synapse. Why does the neuron bother to make that signal? Here's a recording from DNI, the third order neuron, this one, in response to light falling on the ocellus that's driving an L neuron. And every time the light gets to its brightest, the L neuron goes below the threshold for transmission. So DNI's response kind of bottoms out. So it looks like a lot of information that is present in the response by the L neuron to changes in light, that seems to be thrown away. Actually, what this information is doing is to control the production of these rebound spikes. These rebound spikes can be made with current injection into the neuron or with ending light. Whenever a hyperpolarizing response ends, uh, then an L neuron will tend to bounce into producing this rebound spike. So the function of these hyperpolarizing responses is not to be transmitted onwards directly, but it's contro to control how large these rebound spikes are and when these rebound spikes are produced. One of the reasons why these neurons make rebound spikes is that they provide fast signals and those fast signals are needed to communicate at the other kind of output synapse that the L neurons make. These are the terminals of L neurons in the brain. And these branches intermingle with each other. So there are three of these neurons like this, two of them stained here. They make synapses on these branches, and these are inhibitory synapses. Here are a series of three different sizes of spikes in one of the L neurons, and here's the response from the other. So a relatively small spike will make an IPSP in the postsynaptic neuron. A larger spike will make a larger IPSP in the postsynaptic neuron. So these are inhibitory synapses. They also have another characteristic, which is that they cannot transmit for very long. So in this case, what I did was to put a step change in potential into the presynaptic neuron. So it's stepped from uh, being relatively hyperpolarized to depolarized. And here are a series of postsynaptic responses to this signal. These postsynaptic responses uh, don't last for very long. The neuron repolarizes again back towards its original resting potential. So this is quite different from the excitatory synapses that are formed onwards onto DNI, for example, those synapses can sustain transmission almost indefinitely. But these synapses, the inhibitory synapses, only transmit for very brief periods. They have a very peculiar characteristic. And the peculiar characteristic is that the rate of postsynaptic change depends on the rate of presynaptic change. So here are three presynaptic signals changing at different rates, three different ramp speeds. And those produce three different amplitudes of postsynaptic response. And this synapse stops transmitting so quickly that the postsynaptic response really depends on how fast the presynaptic neuron depolarizes rather than on the size of the depolarizing potential. So these two steps both occur at the same rate as each other but both produce the same size of postsynaptic response. And slightly slower changes produce a smaller IPSP there. So this is a rate-sensitive synapse. These are actually world record synapses. The synapse that transmits um, 
excitatory potentials, then that shows absolutely no sign of decrement at all. It can sustain transmission maybe indefinitely. I don't know what would happen if you really drove it very hard. That's a very difficult thing to do without killing or um, losing the penetration of the cell. The other synapse is extremely transitory. The IPSP dies away within a few milliseconds. So a single neuron can make synapses that are first of all of different polarities but also have quite different dynamic properties. So what's all this for? What I wanted to know is how the graded changes in potential become transformed in DNI into spikes. This neuron has a long axon. It communicates from the brain into the thorax, a distance of about a centimetre or so. Axons can't carry graded potentials that far, so they do need propagating spikes. So how is a graded change in potential transformed into a, a train of spikes? To investigate that, what Rob and I did was to use these white noise stimuli. These are fluctuations in light played to one of the acelli, and this exactly the same signal can be played over and over again. So we can see how repeatable the response is. If we have a long sequence of this white noise and then record spikes from the axon, what we did here was to um, record this at three different intensities of light or three different uh, contrasts. So imagine that this was, had the same kind of shape but was more squashed up. That would be a smaller contrast signal. So these are the same kind of signal played under three conditions. One thing to note is that the spikes that DNI produces are relatively infrequent. The maximum spike rate we recorded was 27 spikes per second. So that is pretty low. You can also see that if we line up, um, if we look at these responses under different conditions, this condition is a fairly bright condition and the spikes are fairly infrequent, but we can identify particular spikes that we can see under more favourable conditions as well. So we get the same kind of spike pattern to this particular uh, signature of light stimulus. So these spikes are marking particular fe features of the stimulus and we can look at what the feature is by doing some averaging. So we take a series of spikes and average backwards to what the preceding light stimulus was and a consistent feature is that the light intensity increases a bit and then becomes darker. So what DNI is doing is marking particularly darkening stimuli uh, as light intensity fluctuates. The timing of individual spikes is remarkably consistent. So here are spikes collected into narrow bins and we have repetitions of a large number of the stimulus played over and over again, 128 repetitions. If we look at uh, one of these collections of spikes, you can see that the time over which they're collected is really quite narrow. So the, the timing of individual spikes is very, very precisely controlled. With a lower contrast stimulus, uh, the stimulus wobbling around with the same kind of shape, but to a lower extent, then the spike distribution spreads out a little bit. But in general, spike time Individual spikes marking particular features in this is very precisely controlled with a standard deviation of less than one millisecond. You can take this kind of experiment and extract uh, information to compare with others. We worked out that each spike in DNA carries about five bits of information. There are a few other measurements that have made of how much information one spike carries and five bits per spike is one of the best that is known in any animals. So the spikes in DNI are precisely controlled. Each one is fairly significant to the locust. One question is how is the precise timing controlled? 
Well, that's where I think the rebound nature of the spikes in L neurons comes in. Um, this rebound in L neurons and then followed by the DNI, uh, DN neurons uh, is a very precise mechanism of ensuring that spikes are made at exactly the right time. The inhibitory connections that L1 to 3 make with each other could also trigger or inhibit these spikes and uh, contribute to um, the precise timing. So, to finish up with, why would DNI need to make these precisely timed and rather rare spikes? We know that flashing light that the acelli would see can entrain light beats. These are really old experiments done by someone called Ingrid, Ingrid Waldron in 1968. A few years ago, these experiments were extended a little bit further by some people in Germany who showed that the acelli are responsible for this entrainment and the entrainment can be very rapid. It can occur within one wing beat cycle. So maybe the uh, neurons such as DNI and these spikes are able to do this very precise wing beat entrainment. But more interesting, maybe they can also change the way in which the wing beat, um, the shape of the wing beat, in, in order to steer the locust in some kind of way. I'll need to go behind the platform now. Um, the locust ahead is not at all stable. Locusts really wobble around as they fly. And the first of these videos shows a locust that is tethered fairly firmly on the ventral side of its thorax. And it's going to fly. And what I want you to notice is that these are not exactly publication quality videos, but they're fairly preliminary. What I want you to notice is that as the locust beats its wings up and down, every time the wings are moved upwards, the head nods downwards and vice versa. So the head is really wobbling around quite a lot. That generates a light signal that the acelli could detect, particularly the median acellus that's pointing forwards, would receive a cyclically varying light signal each natural wing beat of the locust. And one of the reasons for this is not just that the locust is expending a lot of energy moving its body up and down, but it's also this rather peculiar curved shape in the back of this shield. This is a characteristic of grasshoppers. This is called the pronotum. And this curve shape here actually rubs against the wing. So what I'm going to do here is take the wing with a forceps and move it up and down. And as the wing moves up and down, it rubs against this back part of the pronotum and moves the head up and down. So a neuron such as DNI will be excited on each wing beat because each time the wings move up, the head nods down, that causes a decrease in light and that will trigger a spike in DNI. The time of these spikes can be advanced or delayed when the flight attitude or the pitch plane of the locust is altered. So if you imagine a locust flying along, it's wobbling its head up and down, but if it does a nose dive, then the overall illumination um, of the median ocellus will decrease, and that makes the spikes in DNI come earlier on each wing beat. And as if it points upwards, uh, the reverse happens. So the timing of the spikes would become later. So imagine a locust flying over the desert. As it flies, each time it moves its wings up and down, the head will nod up and down, and that will cause a signal to the median ocellus. In this experiment, what I did was have a light dark horizon on a screen that the locust was looking at, and these wobbles mimic the natural nodding movement that the head would have for each wing beat. And here the locust starts to nose dive, so its head is pointing more downwards. There's a step decrease in light. And what you can see is that the excitation to DNI increases. Well, first of all, there is excitation to DNI on each wing beat. But as the locust flight attitude points downwards, this excitation becomes stronger. And when, it, when the 
head is returned to its normal position, the excitation is decreased. These histograms show the timing of spikes during individual uh, light cycles. So these light cycles mimic what would happen um, to the median ocellus as the head was nodding up and down. And if we decrease the illumination, as if the horizon was moving upwards, then the spike on each wing beat comes earlier. And that change in the timing of that spike varies according to how great the change in average illumination is. So what I think might be happening is that DNI is looking outwards at the horizon in front of the locust. It's nodding on, it's responding to the nodding movement of the head on each wing beat and providing some excitatory drive to some of the motor neurons. And one of the important motor neurons is this one. This is a rather peculiar motor neuron, but it controls a large muscle towards the top of the locust that is concerned with moving the wings downwards. So what I think the ocelli might be doing is advancing or delaying the time at which these muscles contract on each wing beat, varying the power of the locust to adjust its pitch plane as it flies around. And this is a very preliminary experiment that gives some indication this might be what's happening. In this case, what I've done is to play a light to the median ocellus, and I'm making recordings from this particular motor neuron in, order, in response to this. So this light stimulus is repeated a number of different times, and the, uh, the red banding here indicates the standard deviation either side of the mean response by this motor neuron. So what I hope I've told you is that a celli generate a spike timing code, but they also have some rather odd synapses. Output synapses from L neurons can sustain transmission, but they clip the hyperpolarizing signals. Those hyperpolarizing signals are important because they control rebound spikes. Those rebound spikes are needed partly to trigger phasic synapses, but also these rebound spikes will excite DNI, and that provides a very precisely controlled timing signal. As a result of the locus' own movements, DNI is excited on each of the locus' wing beats, so the ocelli could act as a kind of optical proprioceptor mechanism. And the spike phase during a wing beat in neurons such as this one could be changed if the locus pitch attitude changes. So I'm sorry, I've gone three minutes over. Thank you. A million vesicles. That's a stupidly large number. <laughs> um, I was just thinking that in terms of averaging out noise, you were showing that the um, standard deviation of the synaptic noise didn't vary with amplitude. Could that be because you've got a million synapses there, essentially? Yes. And actually that, that it is increasing, but just by such a tiny amount, given that you've, you've got a low P from an awful lot of synapses. I don't, think you'd, I don't think you'd ever measure the response to a single vesicle. Yeah. Um, one of the ideas I've had, and it's about the only idea I've had, is that there's a lot of variation in how long the individual contacts are. And that might have something to do with the size of signal you need to activate each individual contact. And a bigger signal might activate a greater number of individual contacts compared with a smaller signal. But it is, it is a large number. <laughs> but it's not, I mean, people have estimated the number of synapses released in, uh, from cone and bipolar cells in the vertebrate retina, and it's not, not too different. <laughs> yeah, someone at the back. Um, I've worked on ocular proprioception in humans, and I, 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 this is the reason I'm, I'm very interested in your hypothesis that the ocelli are acting as proprioceptors. 
in humans, we say that visual signal, optical signal is insufficient to tell the rotation of the eyes. And I was wondering if there is any way of, if they only have that as proprioceptor, how can they tell whether it's their head that's moving or it's something in the environment that's moving? Assuming that that locus is on a train and the whole environment is out of the window is moving. How can they tell? Is there a difference in spiking? Have you tried to look at that? Well, they are endowed with a large number of receptors um, associated with their head. Uh, that's one thing. Um, I, I'm not quite sure that I've followed exactly what you meant. Um, so if they have other proprioceptors, then yes. that is a solution to a problem. If the ocelli proprioceptors are the only source of right. information about the position of the head, I was, one, I, I was thinking that the information is ambiguous. So you can't right. tell whether they have moved the head or whether something in the environment has moved. They're certainly not the only sources of information that the locust has about where its head is and where its body is. Um, it has many different kinds. It's got lots of hairs, lots of mechanoreceptors as well. Um, Bill can tell you lots about those, in the legs at least. Um, the, one of the annoying things is, if you were to cut the ocelli off an insect, it will still fly very well. <laughs> so they, they are not actually required for an insect to fly. And I think it's pretty hard to tell how deleterious it is to take the ocelli away. But that's kind of odd because why would an insect go to such lengths to build such big neurons and big synapses if it's not important? It's, um, I don't know the answer to that. Well, I, I would speculate that redundant information is good, so the more sources of a signal you have, yeah. the better the, uh, the average, the, the better the estimate. Thank you very much. Is it possible that the locust can hear its wing beat? Could well be, yeah. And is there evidence for the DNIs getting auditory? Uh, I must admit I haven't looked for that. Um, you could actually what you could hear was the radio on in the background. <laughs> yes, that. Um, yeah, I don't know if I don't know what a locust would hear because its its ear is underneath where its hind wing flaps up and down, and the ears they're sharply tuned to some frequencies, and they can certainly hear bats and they can alter the way they fly as a result of hearing bats. Um, but it's not something I, I can rule out, but I, I doubt if it's important. Okay, I have one question. Oh, couple questions. One question is that, uh, do you have any explanation for the rate or depolarization rate dependent synaptic transmission there between the L1 to L3? For the mechanism of it? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess it could be something to do with fast act inactivating calcium channels, but I partly say that because it would be really hard to investigate that. <laughs> but it's not that, they, it's not that they've run out of transmitter, that's one thing it's not. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. One of the weirdest uh, phenomena I yes. have heard about synaptic transmission. <laughs> okay, another question is that uh, do the DNI neuron receive any kind of coronary uh, inputs from the, the motor circuits? Or the, the Not that I know. It receives information about wind and one of the things I was worried about was maybe the wind information will completely swamp the acela information. Mm. But when a locust flies, um, the wind that it receives onto its head is not a steady breeze. That is also very phasic in the excitation it delivers. So when the head's nodding up and down, it's not just causing light to oscillate up and down, 
It's also providing um, a changing wind stimulus for each wind beat. There's someone here that has a question too. Yeah. When, when you look at the anatomy of this, like, to me, you know, didn't know these things existed before on solid, I thought collision detector. So what happens when these loci come up against something in their path? Could these things become activated and change the... That's, that's where Star Wars comes in. <laughs> they, they have compound eye neurons that are really good. Yeah, at, at collision detection. And what a locust actually does, if it detects something that's some way away, and it, so I, I was going to say aware of it, I will say aware of it, if it's aware of that uh, sometime in advance, it will probably steer away. But something that is going to imminently collide with it, a last, it has a last minute response, which is that it holds its wings up and dives out of the sky. And we do, have, we do have some footage of black kites hunting a swarm of locusts in which you can see some of the locusts will do that in response to predatory birds attacking them. Um, I was wondering, you said there were about 100 photo seconds in there? Uh, about 500. And, uh, do they have a uniform spectral response, or is the spectral response? They are very sensitive to UV, and also they're sensitive but to green. The same. Well, it's a bit of a puzzle. Yeah. I don't know yeah. the answer to that. I think they probably are all the same, but I'm not sure. Okay, maybe they should have more than a copy of. <laughs> 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 I don't know why.